Hi, Stephen. I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. Such a pleasure to be able to speak to you about this film, Cray's Code of Silence. Um, so maybe you could just kick off telling us a little bit about why you wanted to be involved in this project. Because obviously it's a quite a contrasting film to the 1990s craze film and Tom Hardy's 2015 legend. Because this time we're looking at the man who tried to bring down the craze rather than focusing on the exploits of the twins. So what was it about the film that made you want to be involved and why did you want to play Detective Nipper? Yeah, he, he was really interesting. He was also made it onto the great train robbery team and was, was a big part of that investigation. And um, and it was really that that led on to him becoming so sort of powerful within the Metropolitan Police. And so I, I, I was really interested in him. I also thought it was in sort of super interesting, the, the similarity in sort of the way that he had been brought up in, in a working class environment he was a really handy boxer. And anybody who knows anything about the craze knows that they were really into boxing too. So I really like this idea that, that, that they were from very similar paths, but had chosen very different avenues, you know? And, and I liked the idea that there was a kind of um, mutual respect between them. Not that, you know, the criminal fraternity ever really, um, respect the police but if you if you sort of were to choose somebody to be an adversary I think I think somebody who is from a very similar background and and it would be an interesting adversary mm -hmm. so and then when <clears throat> I spoke to Ben the director he told me what he was really thinking and you know it's a low budget film we weren't really able to to recreate 1960s East End, you know, that's very expensive to do. Uh, but what, so, so he sort of described a labyrinthian sort of warehouse that was supposed to be like a metaphor for, for Nipper's brain. But what is going on in Nipper's brain as he tries to, to tell, to tell the story. And I thought it was a really interesting way of, of, of examining the topic and and I think it, I think it, we do a really really good job of of putting you in his shoes you know mm. and you know so in on top of kind of researching the period as well did you go back and look at the other films like thinking of the 2015 legend but then of course going well, back I, to the 1990 yes, Brothers, wasn't it? I mean I did and I remember both I remember my favorite bit from me and my mate Bert used to do this impression of Stephen Burkoff, who is Cornell, George Cornell, he's Cornell in the in the 96-97 version. And and he he goes into this, he goes into this porter cabin at some point, and it's Michael Kitchen and and John McHenry, two brilliant actors. And Burkoff comes into this porter cabin and he goes, the streets stink of Koray. And it's so hilariously over the top and brilliant. That's me and me and my mate Bert used to sometimes walk into the room where the other one was and do that impression. Um, and uh, so I did go back and watch it, which and it was really interesting. It's, it's, it's a decent film. And, and obviously I watched Legend again. And and it's, I mean, Tom Hardy's just miraculous, isn't he? Uh, but it, it's our, our, our movie is not a Cray movie. It's about, it's about snaring the Crays. That said, um, Ronan Summers, who plays uh, the twins, plays Roger and Rennie, is, uh, Roger and Rennie? <laughs> Rennie, Ronnie and Reggie. Um, <laughs> um, I'm now thinking of lots of jokes to do with like tummy settlers. Um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, Ronan does a really fantastic job and, and, and it's very difficult taking on sort of icons like that who have been covered by somebody like Tom Hardy to sort of find a separate spin on it mm. um, because you want the audience to recognize the differences between the two characters and I think he did a really good job of sort of delineating between their personalities. And I always think, I guess the same as they did with the Kemp brothers, of course, it was the two of them anyway, but 
with um, Tom Hardy and in your film, you've got the one actor playing both. So when you're sat across that interrogation table talking to both of them, how does that even work? Are you doing each scene, I guess, twice over? Well, it's even harder for the actor playing both characters, but that must all be quite surreal. It's quite interesting because because one of the things that Ben and I talked about, Ben the director, was was saving those moments where you see them together and making them very impactful. So a lot of the time we kept them apart so that when you do see them together on screen, there's something ominous and, and, and about it. In terms of how you shoot that, I mean, I'm, I'm a real geeky, film-loving camera, you know, idiot. So I really enjoy the technicality of it. Um, but ultimately what it means is that apart from the point times where you see us in a same wide or a two shot, they're not there. Because when Ronan was being Reggie, I'm opposite him doing his Reggie, right? But the camera's pointing at him as he's being Reggie, right? Then when he goes off to be dressed up as Ronnie, another camera gets in and does me speaking to Reggie and Ronnie, right? So I've got somebody reading Reggie and Ronnie for my, my stuff. Mm. And then when the camera turns around and Ronnie comes back and he's now dressed differently and his makeup's a little bit different and it's a different character, the camera's pointing that way again, you know? So it's one of those technical sort of feats where I didn't, you don't ultimately have as much to do with the, with, with the, somebody is always going to be reading the other twins' lines, mm -hmm. you know, it, and, and, but that, I see, I enjoy that element and um, I enjoy what that does to the process and, and having to find, find it within and speaking differently to each of them as well was something that Ronan and I talked about. Yeah. You know, we're trying to play the idea that Nick perceives vulnerability in one of them and pushes him, knowing that 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 it might tip him over the edge in order to make his brother do something, you know, and things like that. We talked psychologically about a lot about how about interview technique and 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 psychological weaknesses yeah. that they might have been able to uncover. And the other thing I liked about the film is even, you know, on top of the fact that it's a different lens that we're looking at the kind of crazy story because it's about, like you say, capturing them. So they're kind of more in the background, but it's also very creatively told. I mean, I guess partly it's about budgets, but also the fact that it's kind of going back and doing the reconstructions. And then you have this very kind of um, sharp contrast between sort of the police work and then these flashes of quite violent scenes and quite graphic violent scenes. Yeah. Um, which kind of change, you know, shift the tone and sh you know shift the rhythm as you go through the film. So is that something you, that you really liked about working on the project that it was I very think, creatively put together? I, well, thank you for pointing all that out. It's it the couple of things to say to that. I think that one of the things that that happens in British culture, and it's not only Britain, of course, because it's also you know with Carlos the Jackal or or any of the big Narcos you know series. Um, but we have a tendency in culture to really applaud the, the bad guys, you know, to, to, in British culture, the craze were heroes, even though they were murderers. And, and if you look at like, um, who's the Australian massive, the massive hero, Ned Kelly, you know, any of these, um, heroes that we sort of see as Robin Hood type characters, you know, aren't really Robin Hood type characters. They're not really giving back. They look after their own. Um, so we wanted to make sure that, that the attractiveness of the gangster was sort of, we tried to show that, that they were, that they had the capability of being really bad people. Everybody always goes, oh, they're really nice to their mum, you know? That's always the thing that everybody says. Um, and in fact, they pick on Nipper 
think, in our story for the fact that he's he's lost his mum when he was a kid. But um, but the the second part of that is the bit that I've just forgotten. What were we talking about? What was the first part of the question? Um, I was just like how it's creatively, you know, like the contrast between the different. Yeah. Parts so of we tried. Music. We tried. Thank you for reminding me. It, we tried to play a snipper because of the thing that I said to you at the beginning about budget. We thought it'd be really interesting to place nipper so that when we go back and we go back to the blind beggar, when we go back to the pub and we're trying to piece together what happened that night and who could have seen something, who would be the person to ask? You know, Ben had this brilliant idea of putting nipper in the pub mm. and in a sort of matrixy kind of way without the budget, <laughs> without the matrix budget, <laughs> um, where where when George Cornell first comes into the pub, um, you know, Nip is there watching and he's imagining what it would have been like to see him come in, where the craze was standing, what time it was, who else was in the bar watching. And that's really fun technically again, because when you're, what we tried to do was do really nice linking pieces between being in the warehouse and then being in, so that they felt seamless. So that as, as he walks from the warehouse, he walks into the pub by doing a clever cut. So I really love that kind of thing. And I thought, you know, I thought Ben did a really wonderful job. And, and Pete, our, D, our director of photography, did a really wonderful job of sort of making that interesting. I mean, Geekland, we also shot the, the flashbacks on, on a different lens, on a more old fashioned lens. Uh, to try and sort of recreate a, a previous time just to sort of show tonal differences between the two as well. So that's fun stuff that us camera boys get sort of nerdy about. <laughs> um, what do you hope that people are going to take away from watching this film? Because we are think... kind of like brought into the life, aren't we? Like this obsessive detective. Um, yes. But it's also taking us, you know, on a bit of a roller coaster ride, you know, like off where it's going to go, you know. I think it's. I think it's a really entertaining little film and um, and casts some light on a, on, on a version of this story that we, we haven't necessarily seen before. And, um, you know, we, we were shooting in the second lockdown and it was a very, it's been a very odd time in our business where, you know, lots of people haven't been working or, or and some people are, you know, the big Netflix and the Amazons who could afford to keep running were running, and but some of the other stuff wasn't. And so what meant what that meant was I was able to ask some really dear friends who are excellent actors to come in and work for very, very little. And it was lovely. It was like being back in sort of like a, a theatre company with some of my best friends and just getting to really work. And, you know, we, we this was like a 15-day shoot and it was really like balls to the wall, fucking grinding and working really hard. And it was it was lovely. And, and I think that shows in the in the in the final product. Mm. And can you quickly tell us what other things you've been working on? Um so you've got another film coming out, have you next year? I have on January the third, there's another film I did um with Colin Meany. It's a gangster film actually where I play the bad guy. Well I play the gangster, not necessarily the bad guy. Um and um that's really fun. That's me and Colin. Uh, Colin plays a a, a Boston uh, uh, priest whose who's Friday evening is disturbed by this guy coming into his church. It's kind of a little tense thriller between the two of us. And then and then on that's January the third, and on February the fourth, a film I did with Alicia Silverstone called The Last Survivors is coming out, and an, an actor called Drew Van Acker. And he was in Pretty Little Liars. And that is a really, really good little film that we shot in Montana during lockdown. And I had this like crazy period where I was going from gig to gig. And and and, and that is, a, you know, they're all really, really good, classy. You know, I think one of the things that's come out of the pandemic is like, if you could get people to one location and bubble them and shoot, it was the perfect time to do it. We've been trying to make that film, me and Alicia and Drew have been trying to make that film for 
for about two years and 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 actually the sort of pandemic played into our hands a little bit uh so that's getting a worldwide release as well on february the 4th and then i just finished um directing a film with uh with anna and ray winston and uh i'm literally leaving you and walking to that window over there see that window yeah <laughs> that window is where my edit suite is and so me and my editor are in there so we're editing right now and um and that's gonna be doing the festival circuit in the new year it's really exciting it's called a bit of light a bit of light fantastic yeah. well i think i'm out of time but it was such a pleasure to speak to you thanks so really much nice for sharing that with too, us and, and best of luck with your future projects and hope you can get out and see uh this film as well yeah please do thank lots you. of love thank you thanks.